So we have circuitry in the brain related to the so-called basal ganglia, and we have GO sort of activating, you know, think gas pedal, and then we have, there's a lot of no-go circuitry. And learning how to keep that no-go, don't circuitry, as we could call it, uh, tuned up is very important. And so many times throughout the day, but I try and get 25 a day where I actively refrain from doing something that I impulsively want to do. Could be looking at my phone, but it could even be something trivial. Like I want to walk to the kitchen and get a glass of water. So I'm actively engaging in self den in, in denial, not cognitive denial, probably that too, <laughs> but how would I know? Um, but in action-based denial. So restricting my behavior in some way as a way of keeping these dopamine circuits tuned up. Also not looking at my phone first thing in the morning for an hour, because knowing what we now know about the second phase of sleep and REM sleep being more predominant, the second wave of sleep and the fact that you're working through a lot of emotional and logistical contingencies, you're reshaping your brain in sleep. That's when neuroplasticity occurs, during sleep. It's triggered in wakefulness, but it actually takes place in sleep, especially that second half of sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you are in a perfect position to what I call receive the download of all the work that your neural circuitry has been doing the night before. But if you immediately go to a sensory experience, especially a rich sensory experience of stuff scrolling by, you're actually missing the information that you processed at night. And even more importantly, that second half of the night during REM sleep is when the emotional weight of things becomes, let's say, you put it on the shelf properly. Things that are important to emotional, emotionally register get put in one shelf. Things that were like the comment you got on Twitter that was triggering, doesn't seem like such a big deal after a good night's sleep. And that's because that second half of sleep is actually when you re-experience these things, but your body can't secrete adrenaline. It's kind of an internal form of therapy or even trauma therapy. And that's why people who don't get that sleep are very, you know, they're easily agitated. They feel like the world is crushing down on them. So when I wake up in the morning, I want to receive ideas that I want to learn from my learning. And if you take in new information, you are not in a position to do that. And 60 minutes is a tough one. So I give myself two no-goes for the 60 minute block if I can do it. And I'll tell you, a lot of mornings I fail, Tom. I don't do it. Interesting. I, I, just, I, make I it found that shocking, now. but I heard you say that in another interview and I was like. Well, I mean, I'm human. You know, there are mornings where um, I get enticed or worse, worse, I find myself reflexively picking up the yeah. phone without having made the conscious yeah. decision. And that's when I realized that you know, we are all deep in this process and I think uh, we have to regulate it. The, the experiment I'd like to do, maybe you'll do this with me as a challenge, because the challenge is always good, is in the new year, I actually want to take every odd waking hour of the day off the phone. So even hours of the day, as long as it's waking, I'm willing to have it on and work with it, but odd hours, just turn it off no matter what. I don't know if this will destroy most of the relationships in my <laughs> life, but. But it, just to see, can I do it on a rigidly externally imposed schedule? Because if you think about it, most of the growth in life comes from these rigidly externally imposed schedules and we hate them.